know, the Principality of Monaco lies halfway between the Maritime Alps and the Mediterranean Sea. Each year in the spring, this setting plays host to the Monaco Grand Prix, that supreme and most glamorous of all sporting events. Now, Monte Carlo is a, a tax haven, a resort for the very rich. It even has a beautiful film star princess. Sort of like a, you might say, a fairy tale setting. But even here, havoc can strike. The racetrack here at Monaco is the most punishing in the world with all its twists and turns and bends and 2,000 gear changes. It demands complete concentration on the part of the drivers for it can play havoc with both men and machinery. A split second misjudgment and you might be looking death or disaster right in the face. In July 1894, 21 mechanical inventions were filled haphazardly with fuel, then rumbled out of Paris at the start of an 80-mile journey to Rouen. The world was seeing the first ever competition for motor cars. For the first time, the word horsepower took on a new meaning. In 1906 in France, the first ever Grand Prix, Great Prize, was staged. The participating cars were as large and cumbersome as they were heavy. The forerunners of today's lighter, sleeker models. But the speed of the cars and the bravado of the drivers were extraordinary. Extraordinary, too, were some of the methods of refueling. Not long after the sport established itself in Europe, it caught on in America. But there, it took a slightly different form. Oval track racing. And in 1909, the Indianapolis Speedway was built. In the following years, Auto racing rapidly increased in popularity, and as public interest grew, the drivers emerged as heroes. Even today, their names are legendary. Rosemeyer, Milton, Taruffi, Caracciola, Nuvelari, De Paolo. But even in those early days, drivers had their misfortunes. Some were lucky, others not so. Some spectators had miraculous escapes. No one here was badly hurt. But some had very narrow escapes. Over the years, the cars became smaller and lighter, faster and more sophisticated. And so the accidents became more serious. None was worse than in 1955. The central figure was Mike Hawthorne, young, good-looking, and the first Englishman to win the Grand Prix Drivers' World Championship. Hawthorne, like many Grand Prix drivers, raced sports cars, too. In 1955, he entered the classic sports car endurance race at Le Mans in France. Thousands of spectators from all over Europe converged on Le Mans to see the annual race, which started at four in the afternoon, continued through the night, and into the following day. In 1955, there was to be a major drama at Le Mans involving three drivers, Mike Hawthorne, the Frenchman, Pierre Levegue, and Lance Macklin. Hawthorne braked in front of the other two. Lance Macklin describes what happened. 
I just scraped past Mike fourth. I sort of missed him. I don't know how much, but it was very, very close. I thought I'd hit him at one time, but I just missed him. And um, I just got the car straightened out and more or less under control again. And then suddenly there was a tremendous bang and uh, Lebeg's Mercedes came up over the top of the back of me. It was the worst disaster in motor racing history. 81 spectators and Pierre Leveg were killed. See, I ended up about, I suppose, 150, 200 yards away from where the accident actually happened. So I didn't see any of the disaster from the point of view of, you know, people who'd been killed and injured and so on. And as I was walking along, I saw all these spectators sort of um, ooing and eyeing, sort of saying, oh dear, how terrible, you know, oh, what an awful thing. You know, I thought to myself, well, you know, that's what you came here for. You wanted to come see an accident, you know, well, now you've got a good one. In the aftermath of Le Mans came a reappraisal. Some countries banned motor racing because they believed spectators were in too great a danger. But while they showed caution, in most other countries, racing continued. Hawthorne had overtaken several cars before slowing down in front of them. What happened? Lance Macklin's view. It took him a long time to pass me. Uh, I think he just didn't realize how long it was taking. And when he did suddenly get past, he either had the option of going round again, which he didn't particularly want to do, I think they were fairly low on fuel, or um, in trying to stop at his pits and hoping that I'd sort of get out of his way. But uh, it was certainly a very bad mistake from a driver's point of view, and I was very upset and cross at the time about it. And I think he knew it too, because he came up to me after the accident and apologized in front of about 10 people and said, Lance, I'm terribly sorry. And he put his arm around my shoulder and was crying and said, uh, you know, I've killed all these people and I nearly killed you and so on. So, I mean, I think there's no doubt about it in his own mind. He knew perfectly well that uh, what he'd done. Hawthorne drove on to win the race. He took the garlands and the champagne, but it was a hollow victory. He was much criticized later and was deeply hurt. But was his victory because of an error? I think Hawthorne possibly did make a mistake, but it's the sort of mistake people make motor racing. And, uh, you know, after the race, if there hadn't been an accident, I might have gone up to him and said, Christ, what the hell were you doing? You know, it must be out of your mind. He probably said, I'm sorry, and you know, I was a bit short of something of space, and uh, that would have been forgotten. But um, as it happened, you know, it wasn't forgotten. Nor was the Mille Miglia. Italy's leading sports car race, attracting the world's top drivers on an open course a thousand miles long. In 1957, three million Italians came to watch without a thought of safety. As drivers negotiated the twisting course, spectators sought every vantage point they could and went as near to the road as they could. But it happened once too often. The Marquis de Portago burst a tire at high speed and hurtled into ten spectators, five of them children. Everyone was killed, including de Portago and his co-driver, Eddie Nelson. The race was permanently banned in its 30th year. It was the end of the road for the Mille Miglia, but at Malacan, it was the start of the second Cuban Grand Prix. Within half an hour, disaster. Six spectators were dead, 30 injured. The event was stopped and the race cars themselves were used to take the injured to hospitals. Accidents like this were becoming more and more common on road circuits. And despite the carnival atmosphere accompanying races on America's oval circuits, Indianapolis, for example, they happened there too. At Indianapolis in 1925, the 100 mile an hour barrier was broken for the first time by Peter DiPaolo. He stalled at the start of the race and had to fight his way through the field from the rear. So they said he'll never make it. He's going too fast. The car will blow up. But the car was in excellent condition. 
know, I averaged 101 miles per hour for the 500 miles, a record which stood for seven years. I didn't realize that when I won the race at 100. But uh, today, it's just amazing to see these little cars, when they hit the wall at 200 miles an hour and the drivers walk away. Well, in our days, we didn't do that. We hit the wall, we had straight frames, straight springs, and these terrible shackles. And when we hit the wall, we didn't walk away, they carried us away. So that's how much safety has increased. I'm trying to compare our cars with the cars of today, it's, there isn't any comparison. It'd be like comparing Wright Brothers' first airplane with a modern jet jobs flying faster than sound. But in those days, we disregarded safety. We didn't have any safety features. First of all, we didn't have a safety belt. And that's why our little boom boom was going up and down all the time for 500 miles. And then we had the helmets, the cute little silk helmets, beautiful. But if you hit the wall, it would change color, you know. And today they have crash helmets, which has been a lifesaver for many drivers. Then they have these uh, fire repellent suits that they put on in case the car catches fire. It's all just remarkable uh, how the kids today, they, as I say, they never had it so good. The green flag drops on another Indianapolis race. It's the fastest in the world. Drivers race for a small fortune in prize money and sometimes for their lives. Some drivers don't have it so good. Winner of the Indianapolis 500 is also one of the world's top Grand Prix drivers, Mario Andretti. Indianapolis, for instance, uh, you're looking at just an incredible sustained high speed per lap. You know, you, we're averaging over 200 miles an hour, and uh, you've got a 500-mile race that's over three hours, and, uh, you know, the, usually the pace is somewhere around between 185, 190 miles per hour all the time. Uh, Monte Carlo, in retrospect, is... Uh, uh, is so different in the sense that uh, you have speeds maybe uh, from 35 miles an hour to 135. finesse at all you got to use all of it here <laughs> because uh, uh, you just it's a place it's so unforgiving so unforgiving that you just uh, you just literally just an inch or two away from the guardrail every lap and you need every bit of that to be able to put together a competitive lap and you can't afford to just slip up and just bang it because a very innocent slap to the guardrail is going to put you in a fist with a failure it's more difficult Monaco, I would say, because uh, from the concentration point of view, if you make a mistake here by driving one centimeter wrong, you will hit the guardrail. At the Nürburgring, you can make some mistakes without having any problems. Problems are the specialty of the driver's mechanics. They find them, diagnose them, and iron them out. Even the slightest malfunction can lead to a car being stripped down and reassembled in hours, ready for the driver to race at ever-increasing speeds. They all have one thing in common. They are there to win. You can only win with a car as prepared as a winner. And uh, you need that type of work, uh, very methodical uh, work, to be able to prepare a car that will go quick and stay together all day. So I rely on these guys 100%. So many factors, so many things, so many variables involved in this business because it's not just your own performance. Uh, you're relying on a piece of equipment that's uh, being bolted uh, by three or four other people. You know, just human factor again involved. And that piece of equipment can, uh, on that particular day, either make you look like a hero or like a chump. <laughs> Racing has no room for chumps. It's too fast, too competitive. Too much is at stake, including life itself. Here, team spirit takes on a special meaning. The operations director, team manager, the mechanic, the driver, all work as one unit. 
they do. Or like as the steering tries to grab away from it, you see that's actually really the problem. You can't hold it against in a fast corner against what the what the trying to do to you. So it ends up you get into a big weave. And because the car the steering is so heavy, you can't keep up with the weave, so it just gets bigger. Do you follow me? If you get into a say a heavy weave. It's always been my biggest ambition ever since I started racing seriously. It was to retire voluntarily on my two feet. Um, and that goes for winning the World Championship or everything. That's more important to me than anything. I think to drive properly these cars you have to be completely physically fit and in always good shape. Rested enough and really sleep a lot and you know, do a physical training to be, to be always in good shape. Because I think if, you, if you're down 2% because you're a little bit tired, I think it's no good. You should always be sharp and rested. Motor racing can be a very violent sport, so safety is uh, of all importance as far as the driver is concerned with his uh, power, whatever we're wearing, and also the safety that uh, can be incorporated in a car. Safety is relative, you know, you can't say I want a 100% safe track because it never will happen. So you just have to work, I think, continuously on safety. And I think the drivers in the past and we now, we're doing a very good job keeping the standards up. But I think in, in 10 years everything will be different again. Because it's a logical development, the same way we develop our cars and ourselves, the safety has to develop it, step by step. Unfortunately, motor racing has reached, very, uh, Grand Prix racing in particular, a very serious stagnation point on all aspects, safety of which is the most obvious and visible. But in organizational aspects, in financial aspects, in every aspect of the sport, it's reached a complete dead halt at the moment because we don't have a governing body who are prepared to do any governing. In 1967, the governing body banned straw bales immediately after Lorenzo Bandini crashed fatally at Monaco. He died from burns, made worse by the fact that the straw bales that he hit caught fire themselves. The straw bales were a major hazard, and Bandini paid the price. This was all that remained of Bandini's Ferrari. In theory, it should be possible to contain a fire and deal with it quickly. This training film for British track marshals shows how a blazing car, handled properly, should be rendered safe in 19 seconds. But in reality, this is often what happens. At the Nuremberg Ring in 1976, Nicky Lauda crashed at 150 miles an hour. Two wheels were torn off, and Lauda's helmet was wrenched from his head. He inhaled poisonous fumes and fell unconscious. Other drivers stopped to rescue him from the inferno. Lauda suffered first degree burns and was administered the last rites. I can't remember the, the accident at all because uh, I lost about one hour of my life there. I can't remember anything. And I don't even know what happened. We just, uh, I just uh, understood everything about one hour after the accident. The, the horror of fire is that it's a particularly nasty nasty way to die and a very frightening thing because one is in the normal way sort of conscious through it but I'm frightened of dying anyway you know it's, it's not how it's the fact that I'm frightened of I feel that if we could uh, eliminate at least a great percentage the, the danger of fire in a race car I think uh, most of us will retire from the sport and uh, we've seen, I've seen so many uh, bad crashes uh, where the guy just uh, needlessly burned. And uh, luckily, uh, a lot is being done. Uh, you don't think it's ever enough or ever, these things ever happen quick enough, but uh, a lot is being done from year to year to uh, try to minimize this danger. The danger of fire and the lack of fire marshal training was vividly illustrated at Zandvoort, Holland in 1973. Roger Williamson from Britain crashed. Fire marshal stood by uselessly and watched as another driver, David Curley, desperately tried on his own to rescue his trapped friend. The car was too heavy and the fire too great for an inexperienced rescue attempt. Curly was as helpless as the fire marshals. The fire truck eventually arrived. It was too late.
Williamson burned to death. Auto racing is dangerous, and it has taken a heavy toll of its finest men. Lorenzo Bandini at Monaco, Joachim Bonia at Le Mans, Mike Spence at Indianapolis, Ludo Scarfiotti in Germany, Peter Revson at South Africa, Piers Courage at Zandvoort, Francois Severt at Watkins Glen, Jim Clark, the greatest of all British drivers and twice world champion at Hockenheim, Germany. Joachim Rint, the first ever posthumous world champion at Monza, Italy. And Wolfgang von Trips on his way to winning the world championship also at Monza. Von Trips was a wealthy German from a title family. He drove racing cars because he loved the sport. And if he had won at Monza that day in 1961, he would have been the first German to become world champion. But he spun out to the side of the track and 16 spectators were killed. So was Von Trips. But racing safety standards have now advanced so much that accidents involving spectators are a rarity. The drivers now put only themselves at risk and they would have it no other way. They lay their own lives on the line, nobody else's. Sometimes the drivers lose. The rest go on, but not regardless. When a colleague or another driver uh, is killed, it affects me in two ways, really. Firstly, obviously, the, 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 the normal reaction of a personal grief and a personal loss of a friend uh, and all the emotions that, that one feels just as if somebody, you know, a friend of one had died and, uh, in a road accident or something, and uh, quite unexpected, a member of one's family. Um, and then on a professional level as well, well, the immediate the first reaction is there, but for the grace of God go I. And then immediately one has to try and say, well, how can we make sure that this can't happen again to me or to somebody else? I think this is something uh, everybody should know about because one day or the other, everybody will die. But I like the sport I'm doing. Sure, I know that it is more dangerous. But for me, the positive side of motor racing is even bigger than the danger. So therefore I do it. I like it, and therefore I do it. And if one day I will find out that the danger and the, and the death bothers me more than the, than the pleasure of motor racing, I will stop. Racing is a hazardous, a dangerous profession. And I quote Ernest Hemingway when he said, there's beauty in danger when it is deliberately sought out. It's a challenge. They barrel into those turns, wide open throttle, as I say, with a salute to the gods. Here I come. But the, they have no thought of fear in their minds whatsoever. I don't have any fears at all. Intrigues, maybe. I admire them. I call them brave kids. And that's exactly what they are.